Good morning, everyone. We are uh, just filling up the room right now. Welcome. It's very exciting to have you all here. Um, this is uh, quite different than our normal conference time or our salon time because this is a big discussion group. So I'll let you know that um, from our conference, we have Jen, Genevieve Vaughn, Heidi Gutner Abendroth, Mary Condren, Darsha Navarez, and um, everyone else, please feel free to use the chat, which will be open during the whole discussion time. Um, before I begin the discussion, we'll uh, check with our presenters from the conference because this is a follow up for the discussion. Uh, we didn't get a chance to really address the comments and or questions you might have placed in the chat. So today will be the time and we're just very excited to have you all. It was such a wonderful, wonderful presentation from each of these women. So um, this is the beginning of our third year. It's so exciting. And at the conference, Genevieve presented uh, her talk, which was the maternal gift economy as the deep alternative to patriarchal capitalism. Heidi presented a radical alternative matriarchy. Mick Mahan presented a Pongon Mati, the continuance of life safeguarded through the consciousness unification of the collective. Darsha Navarez presented the maternal gift economy, sharing mortality and human nature. Morality. Morality? <laughs> yeah. Sharing morality and human nature. Yes. Sorry about that. Mary Condren presented The Motherland, Alienation, Sacrifice, and War. And Susan Petrelli, we closed with War, A Capital Sin of Globalization. So welcome, everyone. And before we open up the discussion, I'm wondering if we could just uh, see if our speakers would like to greet you. Um, short, just a short greeting and say hello. And then we, if you would like to speak or have a question from last week or when you viewed the recording, um, again, in the reactions, you can raise your hand and I'll keep track of all of you. So, um, Jen, would you like to just open up with letting, just uh, reminding women why you decided to have this session? Okay, Jen. Well, just I'm, I'm just saying thank you to everybody for coming also. And uh, we did decide to do this because we really haven't had a, a, a group discussion this like this before. And it would be wonderful, I thought, to uh, to have everybody come and and see what you all are thinking and uh, be able to have a dialogue. So. I'm very happy that you're coming and uh, happy that the other speakers um, have agreed to come. And, and uh, it's, we're in a moment of, of great crisis and we're going towards moments of even worse crisis. And, uh, and so I think it's very important for women to uh, discuss what's going on and the alternatives and, and try to create uh, movements that will have solutions uh, to these problems that have been caused by patriarchy and capitalism for so many centuries. It's got to happen now because of the future is totally uncertain. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And I'll turn it over to Heide, who is the next on the list, right? Yes. Mm, hello. Mm. I'm very glad to be here and to see you all. And uh, I'm much looking forward 
to a lively discussion about so difficult and heavy things Jen has just mentioned. We cannot solve them here in our discussion, but we can clarify our minds about this. And I'm really looking forward to this. So um, hello to all of you. Thank you, Heidi. Darsha, you need to unmute, friend. There you Hello, go. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to be with you again. Uh, <clears throat> what struck me uh, from our presentations uh, at the conference was how people can work at multiple levels. Uh, so my area is psychology, and my focus is on self-transformation. So getting back connected to mother nature, to the earth as a partner, also how we raise children. So that means the uh, way we provide the evolved nest, which is our heritage, uh, shapes the brain to be able to connect, to be part of the earth instead of feeling separated from it or superior to it, so the chip on the shoulder. And so uh, the, the, those kinds of um, aspects, I think, are part of what uh, we can do for transformation. So working on ourselves, working on our child raising, so then those are things we can do immediately, right? Uh, uh, supporting parents and mothering uh, around wherever we are. But then there's the systemic level, which other people work on as well. What's really cool uh, to understand is that we're in a complex system or we live in multiple complex systems and complex systems change when there are a lot of small little perturbations, uh, things that are shifting. And we, as we work on ourselves and work on uh, connecting to others around us, we're making some of those shifts. And so we can make the whole system shift at once when we're all doing our little piece in the puzzle of, of transformation. So good to be with you. Thanks, Darsha. Mary, would you like to have some opening words? Okay, well, I can hardly remember what I had for breakfast, let alone what I had, what I said last week. <laughs> I will try and say something coherent. Um, I'm a theologian by profession, and um, but because of the attitude of the various mainstream churches, monotheistic churches in particular, toward the inclusion of women and the way in which they use the word sacrifice as their legitimating um, controlling idiom, um, I turned back at a very early stage to critiquing the use of the word sacrifice, not only in religious contexts, but more particularly now in, in war. Um, because everybody who, <coughs> excuse me, all of those who are engaged in warfare do it under the rubric of sacrifice. You know, we're sacrificing our lives, but if we draw upon the theories of the death drives, which I do in my teaching on gender and violence, um, we can see that the same people who are ready to sacrifice their lives are also ready to go out and execute others. And so the innocence that usually accords to somebody sacrificing is completely misplaced. Um, it's a form of alienation and um, it's a form of misguided consciousness. So. In my presentation, I drew on a number of poems by um, W.B. W. B. Yeats and Patrick Pierce, who were both um, working at the time of the Irish Rising of 1916. And um, I used two, two poems in particular, William Butler Yeats, who was very much against the Rising. Nevertheless, when the people were executed, the leaders were executed, he asked the question, was it an excess of love? that bewildered them till they died. And I thought that's an, an extraordinarily important question. The alienation of love onto a nefarious cause, such as, as we can see at the moment going on in Russia, and I can't speak about Ukraine. Um, and then Patrick Pierce, in one of his final poems, he was one of the leaders who was executed. He wrote a, a, several poems to his mother and it's um, fascinating the way most warriors, um, I've also studied the discourse of mothering in, war, in warrior discourse, um, and at, the, at, the, at their point of death, their reference point is to their mothers. 
um, and Patrick Pierce, you know, finally um, wrote this poem about my gift to you is my, his own death. In other words, his gift, where she had given him gifts of great love and nurture, at the end of his life, he said, well, my gift to you is my own immortality, because I will be remembered, I'll be remembered. Um, and so again, there's something very strange going on that we need to understand by all the tools of philosophy, social psychology, psychoanalysis, and wherever else. So yes, Darsha, it's a very complex issue. And if we each bring our little bit to the table, we might begin to get somewhere. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mary. I see Susan Petrilli has joined us. So glad for you here. Susan, would you like to unmute and just uh, say some opening statement for us? We are very happy that you could come. Uh, I was just saying, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I don't know about opening words. I'm uh, just, I suppose, uh, thinking of more or less about my presentation last week in line with that. Um, it's undeniable that the world is in crisis. Um, uh, we, we have to talk about ecological emergency, uh, humanitarian emergency. Uh, the situation of crisis I think has been ongoing, in fact, for a few decades now. Um, uh, and, and today, uh, the situation uh, worldwide is explosive uh, and, um, and a consequence of uh, what humanity uh, has been doing uh, with, uh, with resilience uh, and insistence over the past few decades, uh, if, if not more. Um, there are no easy solutions. I mean, we're here because we're all aware um, of, of how things stand. Uh, I think we're all aware of, of the emergency. Uh, on my part, um, I've always believed in, in the power of, um, of education. Uh, and in cultural revolution, uh, in in the sense of um, um, the need for uh, coming from cultural evolution, coming from uh, from education, which is slow revolution, slow and serious and hard work. Um, uh, there's, there's a big problem in the world today, and it's called um, unindifference or non, uh, yes, uh, uh, unindifference. Um, no, sorry, indifference. The problem is indifference in the world today. Um, and the problem of indifference, which is globalized indifference, it's global and it's globalized, uh, is a, a platform, a global platform uh, that facilitates uh, the way things are today, that facilitates uh, decisions and action uh, that go in the direction of, uh, of uh, what we are experiencing today. And uh, the issues involved are enormous. Um, and, and I really do think if, if we don't start looking at education uh, at all levels, um, everybody's education, male and female, rich and poor, et cetera, et cetera, black and white, um, it, it's a global issue. If, if we don't start uh, promoting and insisting on education for all, uh, I, I don't know, you know, how far we're going to go. Um, the world is in danger. <laughs> what else to say? So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for joining us. I see that Darsha has her hand up. And please, any of you who are in this room have equal access to the floor. Jen, could you just say one more time what you always like to say is that about giving the woman a floor? Or now we welcome Harold, who uh, seems to be the lone uh, human male who's in the room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you hear me? 
Mm. Yes, but yes, I'm going to have Darsha speak. She had her hand up, and then we'll we'll uh, come to you, Harold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Darsha, you there? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Susan. I really appreciate uh, your paper last uh, week. It was fantastic, and your comment about education. Uh, my background: I've been a classroom teacher, of different ways, and have a degree in educational psychology. So I think about education all the time. And I think we have to uh, revise what we think education is. So, you know, the British Empire kind of uh, proposed a certain kind of education all over the world and set it up so that the elites in these former colonies continue to do the same thing, mm -hmm. right? That, uh, that the British uh, think is important, which is to, to uh, shape the intellect and reason detached from real life. Uh, so I think that that is what uh, Native Americans thought was crazy because they're, they're, they're young people who went to uh, settler schools, for example, in the Americas, came back and they didn't know how to do anything, <laughs> right? They could talk and talk about ideas, but they didn't know how to live, you mm -hmm. know, and whatever the, the needs of the community were, they didn't know how to meet them. So I think uh, we have to be careful when we talk about uh, the importance of education and make sure it's a holistic kind of education. It's from uh, self-transformation oriented. It uh, shapes the intuition and the emotions and connection, especially, and earth-centered know-how. So I write about that stuff and I just wanted to throw that in to start off the discussion. So. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I answer that? Yes, well, okay. uh, um, I wanted to say uh, to... Is that look? I'm terrible with names, and I can't see Diane. Is that right? The Darsha. You, Darsha. Yes, thank you, Darsha. And and in fact, I enjoyed everybody's um, presentations. Uh, I thought it was amazing the uh, the conference we had last week. So uh, that's why I'm really pleased to be part of it, actually. But yes, that that I agree with every word you said. Absolutely, um, education. You know, this is like everything, though, isn't it? Uh, I'm not talking about education as is, as it is today. In fact, we wouldn't be in this mess uh, if you know if if it was that. Uh, Education today is at the service, is put at the service of the market and is put at the service of capitalism. Uh, it's, it's put at the service of the work market. Uh, so it's today it's uh, exclusive for the benefit of those who have the possibilities, who are equipped to be able to compete uh, in the world, in the education world and on the market. Um, I would say uh, that uh, the starting point of the kind of education, which yes, exactly, it must be holistic, is love. Uh, if, if we would only assume, uh, take on that principle as the beginning principle, we would know uh, how to shape, you know, what education should be, just as we would know what the what political economy should be, if we began with that. Uh, from that perspective. Anyway, I'll stop there because I don't want to take everybody else's time. So yes, thank you, thank so you much, Dasha. Susan. I do agree. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Jen, I thought maybe you might, you need to unmute and then uh, say something. Yeah, but you had asked in the beginning what the thing about the floor is. And uh, I uh, wanted, I say that the, the, greatest gift you can give to the to a woman is the floor but also men are included too so um i i'm so happy that harold Harmon has come to our uh discussion uh, he is a a wonderful historian and uh has revealed uh the life uh style the life ways of old Europe uh, in, in the Neolithic and a whole uh, uh, other way of agricultural uh, society with a women's leadership, uh, matriarchal uh, ways and uh, gift economy. And so that in, the, in a way we can connect the gift economy now with a, a real gift economy that was happening in a large scale in the ancient past. So I'm very happy to welcome 
Harold. Harold, would you like to say hello and any comments you'd like to make? I know that you were at the conference for the uh, for for most of it. So, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Jean, for your introduction. Well, you we are talking about education and the way that we have to revise it it needs revision. Just at the beginning, I want to state that <clears throat> revision of traditional or conventional education is possible. And I know what I'm talking about because in spring this, of this year, one of my books was introduced into Austrian uh, school education it became a compulsory course book for the education of teachers. And the theme of this book is the Danube civilization with all its achievements. That means that from now on or from spring on, uh, mm, school children, well, in the upper grade, are introduced to old Europe. And I think that's a very important step now because uh, usually uh, scientists write for other scientists. And in most cases, the scientists are of the same age and some have difficulty to talk to um, representatives of a younger of a younger generation but that is very important just to guarantee continuity of research and continuity of knowledge construction and i think <clears throat> the necessary link to guarantee continuity uh, in the generation line is that we can reach out and that we reach um, school children. And as I said, in the case of Austria, I was successful. And maybe I will explain what I do. Jane said, I'm a historian. Indeed, I'm a historian of human life, you would say. I started my education as a linguist. And when linguists discuss with me, ah, oh, yeah, we know you are a linguist. And then I discuss with archeologists and they say, ah, oh, yeah, I know you have published in the field of archeology. span And then people in, in the field of religion research, ah, oh, yeah, you have uh, published books uh, in our field, yeah. And for some time already, I don't have to introduce myself to philosophers because they know, oh yeah, that's the guy who has written six books about Plato. So when I'm introduced, it is perhaps more mm, comprehensive to say I'm a historian, I'm interested in human life and how human beings construct their world. And uh, <clears throat> in old Europe, is of special interest and it's some kind some kind of a key to understand that there is a humanity different from what we are experiencing in our world with all the crises because old europe was a time when there was peace and this is not just what critics sometimes say oh a feel god feel good nostalgia that Maria Gimbutas once introduced. No, there is evidence that there was really a peace situation. And if you allow, I can um, tell you an anecdote um, that can prove this. Uh, th yeah. three, three years ago, in November Harold, of, Harold, yeah? Harold, let me just 
uh, interrupt you. We can come uh -huh. back to you for your antidote. I would like to just let our conversation flow as a response to our conference. Yeah. Back to our conference. And I think Karen has a reflection maybe perhaps to the topics that were discussed at the conference itself directly. Yeah. And we'll come back to you, okay? Mm -hmm. Perfect, I have you on the list. So for those of you who are um, here and had, we had a very lively chat from the conference, which we did not get to address. So if the, you're here and you had your question or a comment that you wanted to make, this is the place and the time, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. So Har Harold, I'll come back to you for your antidote. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Karen. Well, the peace and, and uh, yeah, for the peace story. Yeah, yeah. Yes, welcome, Harold. And Karen, welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, I'm... Um... I, I'm a, I was a stay-at-home mom homeschooling and raising my children um, in much of the way that Garcia was um, talking about how we need to do it. I breastfed my, I mean, I, I think I counted it among three children I breastfed for, for 12 years. And um, it took 20 years to get my undergraduate degree and I'm now a doctorate student and I'm working on a sustainability novel as my thesis. Um, Kind of relooking at the Baba Yaga story and children and from a very home centric, matricentric way. Um, I found so that's me. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I found, I mean, my children are all adults now and I have grandchildren. And one of the things that I found was that when you do that and you, you, you raise children that way, it's almost like when Heidi talks about when the exchange economy kind of overtakes that moment of gifting and it becomes exchange that it, 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 when they enter the real world, what they call the real world, and they, they move from the center of the home, they have to be faced with all this patriarchal capitalist stuff. They are coerced to pay rent and royalties to the, the oligarchs. They, 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 they are challenged and diminished for their love centering um, way of being. And they have to kind of like put on some hardness. And, and I, saw, I saw my children sort of like, like lose them to the, the overculture. Um, I mean, they still come back. We still have family and get togethers and I still have my grandchildren in my life and all that. But it's this, the overriding control of the capitalist system, especially right now, is so, um, it's so overbearing. I mean, people don't have time if they're working two jobs or two income families, or they don't have time to really, um, I guess, <clears throat> give what this world needs, <laughs> give their time to that because it's totally consumed um, by the state system. So I guess my question is, 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 and it's a sacrifice and they're feeling good about the sacrifice, you know, and, and, and so all, everything that everyone was saying in the, in, in the conference was all resonated what, what was going on. So, um, and so when I raised my children, it was very kind of like one hand was in, in, in academia and one hand was the real practical stuff when you're raising children, when you, and when it comes to peace, Harold, I mean, it's like no mother wants war in your household. I mean, it's like it's, it's impractical. So from from a matricentric perspective, war is is it, it, is ridiculous. Not only that, but you 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 sacrificed your loved ones to this. I mean, it's insanity. Um, but yet, women's perspectives are diminished. So no one no one no one wants to know what what a mother. What a mother's perspective is, you know. I mean, when I re-entered the academic world, the fact that I had been a stay-at-home mom or a homeschool mom, I mean, I would I went in there telling them who I was, and and that was totally diminished. It was like, oh well, we don't need to listen to a word you say because you're not in the real world or the 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 patriarchal um, academic world. Um, the education system has it, you know, and so. What are the practical ways we can like 
take little small changes or big changes or whatever to 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 move this forward in this kind of intense climate. Yes, thanks, Karen. Um, let's just uh, see that. I definitely see that as a question that she's putting to the panelists who are here. So um, what are some of the small steps that one could take? There are so many different ways that one can enter. So Jen, would you like to begin? Well, the one thing I can say is that you need to look at the bigger picture and realize it's not your fault and that it's a systemic thing that is making uh, your life miserable it, it, or your children's lives difficult who are trying to, or were raised to live a different way. And uh, of course we have to keep on trying to live a different way, but we also can, if, you, if we understand it well enough, we can also explain it to the people that are around us that don't know about it and uh, relocate our values as op in opposition to the to the general patriarchal capitalist values and i don't know i mean there's it, you can get on a soapbox and do it <laughs> that's just yes. one piece i'm sure other people have other things to offer thanks jen susan would you like to so, and we need, we need to try to be concise because there's lots of yeah, us here. So let's, yeah, so I yes. was just thinking it's just so important, um, uh, thinking of education. Um, uh, it's so important to uh, commit to developing a critical, critical consciousness, which is also, uh, if not a bubble, linguistic critical consciousness. Um, uh, that's somewhere to start from working working on the relationship between values uh, signs and values language and values communication and values um, that's something I really insist on a lot uh, because um, living in the community in a global and globalized communication world uh, as it presents itself today has uh, an effect uh, I think of uh, how do you say an anesthetizing effect on the consciousness people are connected and immersed in a sea of signs and messages and lang language communication and uh, I don't know it's as though everybody especially the younger generation are completely numbed so it's important to show them uh, which is what I try to do uh, in the classroom, that there are other worlds, other worlds are possible. Uh, and also that life is absolutely wonderful. It's a gift, it really is. Um, and it's worth exploring in all its aspects. And it's important to have um values uh to be because they you know you you talk to them and they get really enthusiastic I teach at the university uh and all this sounds new almost uh to these students so that tells me how urgent it is uh to talk to the young people and to talk to them about in in professional terms using the subjects we teach i teach philosophy of language and semiotics and semiotics of translation um and of course i teach um according to my perspective which obviously belongs to a, a school of thought uh, where i would say at the heart of my discourse is uh, as values is otherness um hospitality dialogism dialogue uh, welcoming the other uh, we just cannot do anything we cannot go anywhere without the other and so we need to reflect on that and 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 analyze society uh, with these kinds of instruments and values to to work out and understand what on earth is going on that's I'll beautiful stop. thank you susan hi De. when you talk about education I look back on matriarchal societies, not only looking back, but also um, they are still with us today as living very interesting radical alternatives to our patriarchal world. I want to make two points. At first, about education. 
<clears throat> and then about possibilities to change the situation. Education. When you look in matriarch societies, they don't have abstract education. So children live with the adults as soon as they can, can walk around. They are sharing the complete life of the adults. So their education is very concrete and very embedded in the whole um, web of the society. And what intrigues me most, children from very young age are integrated in the ceremonies and the spiritual uh, life of the adults. So they grow up with a spiritual um, um, identity of their cultures, which I think is very important. And as long as we have not the spiritual level in our ideas of education, I think as long as we um, omit it, we omit a very important um, point. The spirituality connects the children in matriarchal societies to nature, to other people, and to all the traditional knowledge. For us, education still is thought in two abstract terms. The education system is an abstract system, and we can introduce a lot of new knowledge, if possible, as Harald has told us, but it still is um, imprisoned in the education system. And Spirituality, a spirituality, a spiritual education could break these boxes and could connect children with the whole life of society and what is going on. Yes, now my second point, whole life of society, not this kind of society where we are in, but a different kind of society where children really can share from the very beginning what adults do and what adults leave and what adults celebrate. I think in this uh, context of new patterns, of new possible patterns of matriarchal, a matriarchal life, and I think what is very important in this context is forming communities which women initiate and lead, and of course integrate men, following the maternal value, values which matriarchal societies show to us, maternal values of sharing, gifting, peace building, and so on, and so on, mutuality. When children grew up in this kind of communities, they have completely different feeling of life of the world around them. And this is not only abstract what I'm telling you, there exists an international movement of communities, communities of all different kinds, of course, very few are led by women, but let me mention one interesting example where a community is led and constructed by women. This is Nashira in Colombia, a women's village, where women have the, built their houses, created their community, and make the decisions. The children are embedded in the everyday life of the adults there. And this, is, this really is a modern matriarchal example. And it was very interesting when I was there, talking about matriarchal societies and values, and when the children were, were listening at the conference, and when I was talking about matriarchal men and young men, and was telling them that, uh, that um, for example, men have the potency to protect life and to support life, then a young boy stood up and said, yes, this I will do during all my life. I will protect life and I'll be with women and and really protect what they want me to do. So you see, when these young, young boys and young girls are in, in, integrated or living in such a kind of community, which really lives maternal values, they have a completely different feeling for life. And when they go out into the, uh, of, into the patriarchal world, I think they see the difference very clearly and they will not transmute into patriarchal men. This was such a positive um, experience I had, which gave me, a, gave me a lot of hope that communities of this kind, which really have a matriarchal root, matriarchal roots, a matriarchal attitude, are the best way to educate children and young people. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, we're fortunate today to have 
Angela Dolmich with us. I'm going to um, invite her after Darsh, Mary Condren, then Darsha, and then I'll have uh, Angela D, Angela Dolmich, because there are two Angelas online. I'll, I'll invite Angela to give a little more background about uh, Nashira for those of you who are unfamiliar and for her comments, the experiment that she that has been going on, actually a livingness is heading into almost 20 years. So let's hear from Mary to respond and then Darsha and then I'll invite um, Angela D. So Mary, could you unmute please? I just unmuted, but I'm happy to pass on this one. Um, and give okay. space to Angela and, and Darsha if they wish. I, I'll come back. I'll come back later. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mary. Darsha. Yes. Uh, just to just to add to the uh, brilliant insights that have been uh, already shared. It's important to understand that uh, in general, twenty-year-olds to forty-year-olds tend to be very focused on building their own kind of identity in this modern world and and on work and, and you know, fitting in. And it's the younger and the older generations actually that are more spiritual, I guess, in a way. Uh, that's why grandparents taking care of young children is so ideal. And, and that was our history and heritage. Uh, so just that piece of information. Uh, I think the, the other point I wanted to make was in every moment we can be modeling spiritual connection uh, emotional connection, being in our bodies and being here and now, and, uh, you know, making statements about, you know, isn't that a beautiful flower? Or isn't this a uh, wonderful landscape where we are? Or uh, honor that uh, insect, don't hurt the spider, let's take the spider outside, or whatever it is. And those ways of modeling connection and being here and present, honoring the web of life, I think, can have an impact wherever we go. So we as individuals can be the you know, instruments of connecting to the people we're with by listening to them. Uh, people don't get a lot of listening in the States. And so we can help them feel like they are valuable and they matter as well. That's all. Let me check in with Mary. Mary, would you like to, to contribute now or? or... Um... Well, what I was thinking um, when everybody was speaking, and I agree with everything that people are saying, um, I, 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 am, I did not contribute biologically to the perpetuation of the human race, but I do have 43 nieces and nephews and 64 grand nieces and nephews. So I have a little bit of experience in, in the matter of children. One of my nieces said the other day, you know, that her 13 year old has had more relationships now by now than she's ever had in her life. Um, because he's constantly on the phone and on the mobile and on the and, you know, she's also afraid of her, him making her a grandmother at, at age 14. But anyway, that's another whole matter. The the question that I that I would be raising in relation to um, education is the fundamental shift that has happened um, between vertical and horizontal um, resources. And Margaret Mead wrote about this many years ago in her book called Culture and Commitment. Um, it had a profound effect on me when I read it. I think it was written in the 1960s. And she wrote about, um, you know, there was a time when education was vertical, you know, that the ancestors, the grandparents, they all had um, a profound um, influence on the younger generation. Um, but with the rise of social media, that is no longer the case. Education is primarily horizontal. And the, the, the pressures on the young children to, you know, to, um, oh gosh, I'm losing my words. What's the word? Um, to you know, fall in line with their comrades and with their peers um, is, is tremendous. And from the work that I do on, on war, um, I'm very influenced by those who work on group dynamics. And um, one of these women called Tracy Wallach talks about the, the phenomenon of the group. 
that the, the group, that we have to really understand what goes on in group dynamics and particularly with young people because the group in some way replaces the mother as the primary source of um, information, education, values, and almost ethics. And so I think with the rise of social media, we, we really haven't begun, I think, to understand the, ex the, the effect that that has had with the constant information, the constant WhatsApp, Instagram, Spotify, um, which was never there for our generation. It has only really taken hold in the last 10 years, you, you know, even bef not even from the beginning of computers. But um, and I don't know where we where we begin. And because I was saying last week about the um, envy and gratitude, the article, the essay that written by Melanie Klein and the difference between envy and gratitude that, you know, a matriarchal or a matricentric society might be cultivating gratitude because it's the culture of the gift. But every single thing about our culture um, cultivates the culture of envy, um, which also feeds into what I'm talking there about the death drive. Um, so I think the challenge is, is you know, extraordinary and um, it's very hard to know where to begin. I'll just say one thing, though, when, about the, the language of sacrifice, because Karen mentioned that, you know, that her children talk about sacrifice. I think you need to critically interrogate those words every time they're used. Um, people are choosing to go to war. And use, you know, and that by using the word sacrifice, it legitimates what they're doing. Um, you never talk about, you know, I'm, I'm going to, if I'm having an abortion, I'm going to sacrifice my child, it, I'm choosing. And why do we keep on using that word, which is a weasel word, which um, covers a multitude um, and doesn't really take responsibility for the effects of one's actions. So that's my little contribution for now. Thank you. Mary, before you uh, mute again, could you just define what a weasel word is? Weasel words. A weasel, do you know what a weasel is? That the animal, the animal weasel is one that kind of gets on, in under your skin and stings you and poisons you. I think that's what it is anyway, but that's what I mean about the word. It can be used in so many different ways and it can cover a multitude and it can cover all the nefarious motivations that um, go into one's actions. Um, and gives them the, the veneer of respectability and even virtue. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I'm trying to remember that um, there are many people, there might be many people on our global meeting whose English is not their first language. So that's why I wanted you to clarify. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to just make a a reference to the comment because Peggy Antrobus uh, did put a comment in uh, thanking, you know, a thanking Karen for the reminder of how much we who believe in the values of the maternal gift economy are up against the dominant values of patriarchal capitalism. Harold, would you like to share your peace story with us? Yeah. Okay. You can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can okay. hear you. <laughs> Um, so the topic is peace, and so it's a very essential topic for all Europe and for the lessons that all Europe can teach us so that we may be able or may take initiative to revive those teachings. Well, the occasion was... Well, um, what happened was about three years ago, yeah, three years ago in November of uh, 2019, <clears throat> there was um, an event organized by the academic publisher in Belgrade, in Serbia. Some of my books had been translated into Serbian and they wanted to present them to the public and a round table talk was organized um, archaeologists and cultural scientists from the uh, from some um, countries in the Balkans were invited I was invited naturally as the author of those books and we had talks and I knew the participants from earlier meetings 
because I, I've spent uh, much of my time in excavation at excavation sites. And um, I knew that those people are mostly people who don't recognize the wood because they have to handle so many trees in their on their premises that means well they don't see the bigger picture and the discussion started and well it went there and there and i was afraid okay we don't arrive at any conclusions and then neda tashic the main excavator of the main site in Serbia or at Vinča, uh, who had done decades of research of his own, he stood up and said, okay, people, listen, we have to be aware of something overarching. And that is, imagine in the Vinča area, in the whole region, there was peace for more than 2,000 years during the old uh, European uh, time. Yeah, well, I stood up spontaneously and thanked him for this overarching and weighty statement because he certainly knew what he was talking about, peace. There are several indicators. Let's not go into detail now, but there's enough evidence, evidence to show that old Europe was a peaceful society. And when I talk to skeptics or to pe or who people who say, well, I'm convinced there always has been a war in human, children, uh, in uh, human history, and I cannot imagine even a state of being where you have um, peace for 2000 years. And the main thing, the clue is that people don't understand that old Europe was not just any culture, not just any traditional culture. It, on the contrary, it was the first high culture in the definition of civilization. That means old Europe had produced um, achievements that were reached in other civilizations in Mesopotamia, in ancient Egypt, or in China much later. So it was the first <clears throat> society where high standard achievement uh, had been reached. And how was that possible? In a society that was complex, but without social hierarchy, without power play uh, among people who um, who wanted to subdue uh, other people. Uh, it was simply the pure dynamics of people, um, of people's initiative in a peaceful environment where their creativity could flourish. And I think that's a great consolation for us today. So that those people developed, created high standards of living, the highest uh, of the, uh, possible at that time, they created a civilization without the pressure of social hierarchy, without the pressure of uh, political power play. That means give people uh, space enough so that their creati creativity can flourish and they can change society. They can make all revisions that the creativity of the human mind can create. And I think this consolation should bring us to the point that we try to do much public work to make people understand what kind of an exception old Europe was. And they had peace for 2,000, 3,000 years altogether, something that we cannot imagine uh, now. And people were not forced to um, reach achievements, but they did it by on their own initiative. That means because people feel, uh, felt well, and that means everything was in a balance. And the great teaching of old Europe is really that we should be able to diminish the distracting factors, the negative factors, so that we may 
at least in part or go into the direction to create um, a society in a balance and we can we have the showcase of all europe it is possible so that we can uh, so that our creativity can flourish without pressure we are not pressured but it's it comes from inside of us thank you harold that's beautiful um old europe is a wonderful example Heide has given us many examples in her book of living traditions, as well as Darsha and Mi'kma'han, that there are contiguous uh, matriarchal cultures and peaceful cultures that still exist today that are fighting for their survival. But absolutely, we need to, in especially the Western mind, remind people that uh, it's in our human experience that we that we will come to this place of the maternal gift economy. I see that, um, Susan, I'm gonna come to you after Ziola uh, put in the chat that she has a three-part question about the conference and then I'll come to you, Susan. So Ziola, could you please unmute and Harold, thank you so much for, for your uh, references. And contribution. Well, okay, really quick. Um, <clears throat> I guess uh, the capital question, the capitalism, but then capital itself, don't they, um, isn't capital, can't capital change in, or isn't there various types of capital? And don't they actually exploit that there's various types of capital um, in order to kind of continue um continue capitalism and then i guess the to know the name of the actual capitalism would um be good like uh venture capitalism like you know currently is just a plague on everything you know um but uh and then also with that you guys talked about the word radical, and I had no idea that that word came from root. And so when you say radical, um, I instantly thought like, are they asking us to be extremists in terms of like, like, cause uh, I know within like, uh, like if you say radical to somebody within agency, they think that you're a terrorist like by default, because there's a misunderstanding of that word. And so um, so I'm just curious as like, I guess more, more insight into why we're choosing that word um, necessarily. And then uh, the third part um, is just an experience I had yesterday. I took my son to the U of M uh, Art Museum, the University of Michigan Art Museum. And on the wall, like you can see that the gift, the idea of the gift is, is you know, finding its way in uh, to the universities and into academia, but it's almost like a misinterpretation of the gift. Like they would start their exhibit with like a dot that says gift. And I got so excited. I was like, I got to take a picture and show uh, Jen, but then I would read the description, it would be like, who did the university receive this gift from? And it would be like two rich people's names, right? That, and like no connection back to that, the gift is from the earth, like that is our mother, you know? And so um, I don't, I'm kind of at this state of like not knowing what we do next. Like we all know, and we come to these conferences and we come to, you know, the monthly uh, webinars, but like what, what to do next is kind of, um, or other than, you know, the individual stuff that Darsha has explained that, you know, we're doing all the time, but we're looking to you all as our leaders because, uh, you're who we have, like you're who our leaders are. So 
I guess that's what I'm asking is that kind of those kind of broader questions. Yeah, Zyla, thank you. Uh, Karen also asked that question, you know, what is the next step? But the first part of your question, I'm going to refer to Jen and then I'm going to go to Haida. So Jen, can you uh, address this capital and radical? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, capitalism is the system that we're living in. Um, and it is a, it has a mechanism. It works on the mechanism of exchange. And it actually um, takes gifts from everybody and channels them into capital, into the, uh, the people that are making the most money uh, or corporations. And so it's, it is a very negative mechanism, even though it has brought a lot of technological improvements, but it is not, um, it is not consonant with life on earth. It, so it needs to radically change. And um, so we, we need to do a different economic system and that needs to be based on gifting and that needs to be understood through re recuperating the values of unilateral giving that are uh, that we all learn in being when we are mothered by in our earliest childhood, but which are taken away when the whole exchange and capitalist economy is is superimposed over those, and so. Um, we, we are educated into a value system that goes with capitalism, and it's a competitive value system and an ego-oriented one. And we are not going to survive on the planet this way. So we, we really need to revise the whole economy. Um, and whether they call it venture capitalism, which is a specific kind of, of money-making uh, way of investing in, in in young companies that's just part of the main the whole big uh tangle it's not any thing better than any other part of capitalism um then radical i use i used the word radical in my talk the other day because we need to get to the root of the problem. And there is a root to the problem. And that is really that we have excluded the mother-child relation from the whole of thinking about the world. All of our philosophy in, in the West, but everywhere except I would say uh, the philosophy of the native peoples, uh, all of our Western philosophy has excluded the maternal relation and so all of our our philosophy doesn't include that and has go, gone into whole abstract thinking that leaves out the values that come from mothering and being and being mothered and uh I, you know that's part of the whole gift economy idea and i've written a lot about that and i won't go into trying to explain it all right now like I can't go into trying to to uh, explain capitalism either, but that is, you know, you, there are a lot of books you can read of the, about that, including Marx, is, which is, I think, the best explanation of, of capitalism there is. Then, if you're seeing, you know, gift, everything is, there, gifting is throughout our society, even though we have uh, the the whole market takes from it and has chopped it up into a lot of different categories. And so you can see the kind of gift that that university was, uh, was um, promoting, which is the gift of some uh, philanthropists of some kind of uh, of money for the, the university to do something 
with. And, um, and that is one kind of a gift, but it's not a kind of a radical gift that is going to change things for the better. It's usually a, a just a, one example, a small example of somebody that has a good heart. And or that wants some kind of publicity. I don't know. Although there are many, many reasons for people to give gifts, but we have to be radical enough to see gifting as a basic uh, mode of human existence. That, as I said, is kind of chopped up into little pieces by the way that uh, the, that the whole exchange economy and the market functions. And so, you know, even if you, you even a, a, if you get a loan, that may seem like a gift. That's because a loan is, is hard to get. Well, somebody gives you a loan, that seems to be a gift. Anything that really improves, your, that satisfies your need that is not given to get money back is a gift. Of course, a loan, it, they, uh, they do give it to get money back, but in in so, some circumstances, when the loan is, is scarce, it can seem to be a gift. So it, it's actually giving and receiving is everywhere, except that it is like has this parasite of the whole exchange economy on top of it. Anyway, that is my way of experience. And that's your story and you're sticking to it. Thanks, yeah. Jen. That's a great one. Um, I love your story. Haida, I'm going to go to Haida and then ask our other presenters if they wanted to respond. And then Angela, I'm going to come back to you. Okay. So Haida. Yes, I would like, I would also like to come back to the word radical. I consciously called my presentation a radical alternative matriarchy. And this means, as one of you have said, going back to the roots. And uh, the root in our personal life is mother and motherhood. And the root in history is matriarchy. The word matriarchy, I often explain it, uh, does not mean a um, rule of mother because the Greek word archy or hierarchy has a double meaning. It means domination, which is I think the later meaning and the earlier meaning is beginning origin. So if you translate matriarchy, it means mothers at the beginning. And this is true for our individual life. And it's also true for the cultural development of humanity. So we really have to go back to the roots. And the root of all this is Mother Earth. Um, <clears throat> matriarchy uh, is not only an exception. Uh, we have today <clears throat> in several continents still, still existing matriarch societies. And when we look in history, I do it now and I present it in my new book, then you will find that matriarchies are, have been everywhere in the world at the culture, at the beginnings of culture, not only in old Europe, also in other continents, everywhere. So that the hypothesis or the idea that before patriarchy began, we had a matriarchal epoch all around the world is, um, has some basis and has some evidence. As I said before, my, my book, which is published now, shows something about that, shows it for some cultural regions, and I will continue on this research. So this is um, about the, the root, the root of what motherhood is for our individual life and what matriarchy is for the cultural development of humanity. Let me now uh, say some two ideas about the question, what are the next steps? I also presented this in my, um, in my uh, presentation at the last week at the conference. The next steps, if we want, to, if, in my opinion, or my, I'm convinced if humanity will survive, we have to revive or to recreate or invent new matriarchal patterns and new matriarchal ways of life. These maternal values, which some of you have mentioned here, peace, mutuality, 
caring, nurturing for everybody, caring for the needs. And these power plays and all these societies, patriarch societies, uh, which are based on power, have to be have to over have to we have to overcome this. And how to come to matriarchal patterns in our modern times? This question uh, has this quest. I was um, thinking about these questions for, for many decades, and I discussed it in many discussions with different people. And I have to put it short now. The outcome um, for the next steps would be that we had to look at the current alternative movements, which in my opinion include some matriarchal elements, even if they don't call it like that. The ecological movement, feminist movement, um, movement of communities, the movement of indigenous peoples, everywhere you can find different matriarchal patterns, but not the whole picture. So I think it would be necessary that between these movements, bridges, the bridge should be created so that they can uh, collaborate and work together. This is a possibility. But we as women have the poss possibility to much more direct steps. As I said before, we need to create communities which are initiated and led by women, following, following these maternal values. Caring for the, that the need of every body would be fulfilled especially women who are mothers should create these communities because they know how it is with the gift giving to children and how to care for the needs of others and they can integrate men as some living examples i just mentioned Nashira, i can also mention rojava and some women's villages in africa and so on they exist but the problem for all these possibilities to create this uh, communities of affinity like symbolic matriarchal clans, the problem for them is that they are, most of them lack money, lack resources, and if we would start to create such women's villages or communities, we always would feel that we don't have the resources for this. So I think next, this is a political, creating a community, we could do this and initiate this individually. If we want to get rid of the way of life, we are forced to live in patriarch societies. But combined with this should be a political demand, the demand that the economy should be given back into the hands of women. For in each matriarch society, women have the economy in their hands, not as in ownership, but as distribution, distribution to the needs of everybody. And so it functions quite well. And this is the basis this of women and economy doesn't mean patriarchal economy it means having the land the um with the wealth of a region the food of a region and the possibilities what the earth can give in a region in their hands this is this this is what what is the basis and the strong ground for matriarchal women in matriarch societies so we need back the economy in our hands it means land and all what a region can produce houses and of course, to, to get it, we need um, the wealth of the national states back in our hands. I also, also call it uh, equally shared economy. It means that half of the wealth of a national state should be given to the hands of women. For it, it, it belongs to them. It is continuously stolen from them, but it belongs to them. And I'm convinced that women very, very quickly would create communities which have matriarchal values and matriarchal patterns. They can co uh, create cooperatives, they can create their own institutions following the maternal values and matriarchal values. And when this politi political demand uh, will become reality, then I think um, maternal patterns, matriarchal patterns will arise quickly because women are not interested in capitalist economy and making a lot of profit. Women as mothers and millions, millions, billions of women are mothers, are interested for caring for the others that they can grow up in a good way and can thrive. So um, 
the economy, I would not say the economy back in the hands of mothers, but in matriarch society, every woman, if, if she is a biological mother or not, is regarded as a, as a mother because she also cares for everybody in the community, in the society. So half of the economy back in the hands of mothers, be, be them biological mothers, spiritual mothers, intellectual mothers, what kind of all. Then maternal values, which are so, so much lacking in our patriarch society, will be honored, will have a good basis, will have a good ground, and will thrive again in these communities and, um, and all what is connected with them. We can see this not only in the special communities which I mentioned, we can see a, a germ, a beginning of this kind in the region of Rojava in northeast Syria, <coughs> Syria, where women <coughs> uh, started to create women's villages, women's institutions, women's academies, and so on, and to connect the people in their region in a peaceful way, not only the Kurds, but also other, all other ethnicities which are around. This is like a beginning of a matriarchal society. Of course, they are threatened today in a serious way by the attacks of the Turkish government. But with these examples, we can see that what I say here is not utopian, but it's, it's uh, practical and has still some starting points in reality. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was thorough and wonderful for uh, current examples. Angela, I see that your hand is up. And Harold, I saw you. I see mm -hmm. comments also in the um, chat. But I wanted to give an opportunity to Susan, Mary, and Darsha if they wanted to respond to this uh, question about these words from the conference. So uh, Susan, I, I saw your hand, but I don't know if you wanted to respond. Yes, yes. Well, uh, there are lots of observations to make as people speak, and then um, I don't know, uh, I forget. But uh, look, um, I, um, I was enthusiastic to listening uh, to Harold, uh, thank you, uh, talking about peace. Um, all words are polysemic, they have many meanings. And peace is one of those, you know, we, we, when we talk about peace, we need to distinguish between the peace of war, peace as truce, peace ensuing from war, and peace which is free from that kind of logic, uh, which is identity logic. Uh, so, and Harold was not talking about the peace of war, he was not talking about the peace of truce, he was talking about peace uh, uh, as as we should all understand peace uh, outside the logic of um, of, of identity uh, repression uh, assertion of one identity over the other and so forth outside the capitalist um, mentality culture today uh, and it was exciting to uh, hear about learn about 2000 years of peace because um, this is the point, um, whether it was 2000 years of peace or not, to talk about peace, not pu not peace as truce, as the interval between one war and the next, but peace as the condition uh, of life is not utopia. Um, it is possible. I, I, I so agree with that. The, the problem today is that they tell us, you know, this is the world. This is the, the what this is reality. Uh, there's no way we can change reality. This is the way things are. You know, that's that's the way people think. That's the way we're used to thinking um, today as a result of the system that we live in and that represses our minds and our thinking. And I just wanted to say that it, it, uh, what Howard was saying was really interesting to my ears because it really confirms uh, the research that is going on, the dialogue that is going on um, about um, evolution, uh, the evolution of, of the hominid, uh, thanks to uh, a biosemiotical condition, uh, modeling, 
um, which has a characteristic syntactics. Um, we can't go into all this now, but it would seem that a characteristic of the human species, species our, um, it's an innate characteristic, is modeling endowed with syntactics. And what does that mean? I think I mentioned this last time very, very quickly. It's a capacity that we have, an innate capacity that we have for language, creativity, innovation, inventive, inventiveness, um, uh, movements of this sort, uh, and translated into our world today, uh, into the world, let's say, uh, of consciousness, human consciousness and knowledge. Uh, it means also that we and we are endowed biosemiotically, biologically, uh, not only for creativity, but also for a capacity, the capacity for critique and for responsibility, and certainly for otherness, for alterity, for opening to the other. Uh, we, these are actually characteristics of the human species specific um, characteristics, and which, which is important, I think, to, to underline. Um, and another, another thought that came to me, uh, we, our society, uh, certainly Western society, has been dominated by the principle introduced by Thomas Hobbes, homo homini lupus, man um, a, a wolf a danger a threat for the other man uh, the human being a danger for the other man so according to that uh, ideology and vision of the world uh, the other uh, is 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 a an enemy and I have to defend myself from the enemy. This has been, let's say, said very simply, the, the principle that somehow has, has modelled um, our civilization through the centuries. Hobbes was um, 17th century, Seicento, I think, yeah. There are, this is a vision of the world. It's an ideology, uh, an idea. Um, instead, another story says, no, um, it's not fear that is at the beginning of relation of human relationships with the other. It's not fear at all. Uh, it's this dimension of otherness, which, which we can translate into uh, the um, terminology of the maternal gift economy terminology and say uh, it's caring for the other. It's being concerned. It's a dimension of otherness uh, where the main, the first movement is uh, concern, care uh, for the other, hospitality, welcome. And then what happens? Um, we move into societies which um, insist on identity logic. When I say identity logic, I mean closed identity where uh, life is about me egocentric me, uh, short-sighted me, short-sighted interest, uh, which puts me in a position uh, to not uh, open to the other, to fear the other ever more, because the more we uh, barricade ourselves um, within, the, within the limits of that kind of identity logic, the more we fear the other, because we create, we contribute to creating our own enemies. And uh, this is the dominant logic today, unfortunately. This is the dominant logic in the whole idea of this is our world and we can't change it. We all live in our boxes and that's where we need to stay. But no, um, scientific research has shown us that human animals are actually geared, created, constructed to be creative, to be innovative, to be generous, to be caring. So I think that's a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, starting point uh, for critique of the world as it is today. If we understand the condition of interconnectivity, um, of interdependency, which is inescapable, we need each other, we, we, we are each other, we live together with each other, uh, it's a life principle. Um, if we understood that, and when I speak about education, this is, you know, this is the kind of education I'm, in, I'm interested in promoting. How do we arrive at 
the state where we are actually we have become the menace of the world of life um, and I'm not talking about not only human life, but, you know, we're threatening life on the earth, aren't we, in our ecological system. Thank so, you, Susan. Yeah. That, those were some, those thoughts. were fabulous, many different thoughts. And what I'd like to be able to do is, um, you know, we, we need to have self-responsibility. There are probably triggered lots of ideas for many people. So I want to make sure that I come back to the two other speakers who haven't spoken in response to the word radical and um, uh, see if you at this point want to respond to that question, Darsha and Mary, and then check in with Jen and then actually go to Angela to give us her example. And then uh, if we have time, Harold, because I'm realistically looking at we are now sitting at 12.30. So we've been on the call for an hour and a half. So Darsha? Thanks. <clears throat> well, there's a bunch of things I would like to say, but there's I don't want to take all the time. Just let me say about identity. You know, this identity uh, is something the Western world has really emphasized. But in our nomadic forging heritage, which is 99% of our history in those kinds of societies, uh, identity keeps shifting. You don't have one identity. It depends on the context. Your people will call you something different in a different context, and you won't, you know, glom on to one. That, way that's the keep. whole point, though, isn't it? I mean, identity is not where they're making us believe it is. It's not compact monologue. Right. So what we do with kids is we say, write your name, and and we force them into one identity. Where are you from? What are you going to be? And it's like we narrow their options and then people get caught up in being a part of this group or having this name and they, and then we raise them to be, you know, stuck in that way. But our heritage is to be able to take multiple identities, a shift, shape shift with an animal identity. What, what's the beaver feeling like and what are they doing? And, and to be able to move around in the world as part of this very dynamic flowing system so uh, we have to realize that, again, the Western education parenting system is forcing us into these very strange ways of being that narrow our capacities. So we've got to really pull the rug out wherever we are uh, and understand our basic needs first. That's really priority, I think, for building a good brain that is flexible and open and attuned to others in, in very uh, non-egocentric ways. And then one other thing about the our heritage is they were very fiercely egalitarian and they would not allow an ego to get inflated. We allow ego inflation all the time. We actually force it on children. They have to have an ego to protect themselves from the undercare. They they don't receive their basic needs uh, fulfillment. But the uh, in our heritage, they used lots of playing to to and teasing so big hunter gets a big animal and then they start teasing him right oh it's so small we should go back and get a rabbit it'd be bigger until they laugh and why do they do that because otherwise the ego gets very dangerously big uh and they do all sorts of ceremonies and playful things where they're shifting genders uh you know pulling a rope and the the men will be on one side the women on the other but then when one side starts to win people from the other side go help the other so it's not about winning it's about uh, you know, getting out resentments or whatever and, and playing until everyone's on the ground laughing. So we got to get back to playing. We got to get back to letting our egos go and learning how to do that. And the Asian uh, philosophy and approaches are very good at this, the Wu Wei, going with the flow of life and letting go of that individualism. So, but then everyone's very individualistic too in our ancestral context, uh, very unique, each person. So I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Darsha. Mary? Um, just briefly, I want to respond to two issues. Um, I'll start with the question of identity. And again, going back to some of the post-Kleinian um, theorists who were charged after the Second World War to set up a German civil service. Um, and a couple of psychiatrists were involved in this. And um, they, they worked out a scheme when they were interviewing um, potential candidates for the German civil service, and many of them were former Nazis. And they distinguished between those who, when they asked, you know, what do you want for a new Germany? And anybody who um, 
talked about identity was automatically put into the schizoid paranoid position. In other words, they would just continue on um, the politics of identity, which had brought Germany to its knees. Um, and those who had, um, those who spoke about the aim, what is our aim for the future Germany? Um, they were considered to be relatively healthy and they were the only ones who were chosen. Um, and so there's been, you know, out of that work, there has been a great deal of other work on group, group analysis and group systems. And I personally experienced that when, you know, being part of an institution or a group that got into difficulty, um, you know, consultants would come in and say, okay, what is your aim? And you begin with the aim and you do not begin with the identity. And that's a fundamentally healthy way that I've certainly managed groups over the, over the, the last several years. Um, the second thing that I would just respond to is Iola's question about capital. And I think this is hugely important question because we all have capital. I don't have, um, my mother used to have a saying that she never worried about money because she never had any to worry about. <laughs> but you do have a lot of other capital. And um, similar, you know, we have social capital, we have artistic capital, we have cultural capital, we have um, religious capital, we have symbolic capital. And all of those forms of capital actually are, um, very important in how a society functions. And there's a, a French theorist, I put it in the chat, a guy called Pierre Bourdieu, who has written extensively about the, the different types of capital. And um, just as I said, I don't, have, I don't have money or financial capital, but for many years, I've directed a thing called Women's Spirit Ireland. And we were trying to find a way of hearing each other into speech, because in the, in the Roman Catholic Church, you know, we had no, no position. So how do we begin to hear each other into speech? And to do that, we began celebrating the festival of Bridget. Um, and we've done that now for over 30 years to such an extent that the Irish government next year has instituted a public holiday. So the 1st of February is now a national public holiday and will be in perpetuity in honor of Bridget. So that is giving us an in, a kind of an in way, a way in into the cultural and symbolic capital that um, we might never have had if we had continued just simply you know, being in opposition to the um, identity politics of the patriarchy. So I'll put that name of that theorist in the chat who writes about cultural capital, um, and thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, I'm gonna go to Jen, and then I'm gonna go to Angela D. So Jen. Um, just to re replying to, to Mary now, I mean, I would like to call the cultural capital as a collection of gifts. I mean, we are, use the word, we, we use the economic uh, the capitalist market words for things that really may be gifts. And so we don't recognize them as that. And, um, and, and I would uh, say also that uh, uh, from what Susan was talking about, about our now being, having these values of being separate and individualistic and, and so on. Also that comes from the actual exchange that we're doing daily all over and over again, that process in which you only give in order to get back. And it seems maybe too simple to be important, but I think it's really fundamental and it's kind of a, 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 a logical mechanism that is in our, it's been implanted in our consciousness and it is distorting our human being of who we are as basically um, maternal beings, all, all of us, men and women. And we have been distorted into that egotistical co competitive mode that is what is leading us off the edge of the cliff. Thanks, Jen. Okay, I'm circling back to Angela D, who um, uh, was unable to actually share. Uh, Heidi referenced her as a living example of um, an experiment, actually a maternal and a gift economy 
community that is current day. Um, so Angela. First of all, well, let me, uh, those who don't know me, I am Angela Dolmech, Angela Cuevas, really. I'm from Colombia, Cali, Colombia. Um, definitely a different community, a different society from where most people come. Obviously, we are in a very unequal um, society in Colombia. And I just really would like to, in a way, show you how, how Nachira started. Um, Nachira, uh, as an eco village, uh, I did very kindly introduce what, uh, what sort of community it started as. And, and it is now 20 years later because we started that, uh, well, you know. Uh, very, very uh, 20 years ago. And um, it, is, it, it is interesting to see that the way we started was the need for women who were 30% of Colombian women are mothers who don't have a husband, are, are single mothers. And they usually are, are, are on their own, uh, have on their own, on their own shoulders, the bringing up the children. So basically, what we started with, with these women, we were definitely, at one moment, they were making a new paper. And the most needed was a, was a, a roof over their heads. They need, a, they, need, they need a house. And I think that is what most women really want, to have a roof over your head. And, but how can you buy? How many, how many people can really afford to buy a house or pay rent? in a house that you really care for and not to have over your shoulders the weight of the mortgage or of the, of the rent that every month you have to pay. And you don't know when you might be addicted or you might have to leave or what you're going to happen. So we started really trying to see how could we get free houses for these women who were head of family and who could never be able to afford to have a house because they will never be able to get above the poverty line. So basically, uh, these houses were free. And they were partly private and partly public uh, finance. And, and they managed to start uh, their life with the houses were on their own name, even if they had, sometimes they had a husband or somebody, or somebody who lived with them. I and mean, many, many of them were not married, but there was a man living with them. So, but, but the houses were their own. So they, were, they, they had the right to see who could come in their houses and also on their bodies. So they would know who would they welcome in their bodies, who, what man would come there and they didn't have to get a man so that, they, so that that man would be able to pay for the maintenance or, or anything like that because it was, it was, it was them. So in the children, society was built on matriarchy, on the, on the women, mothers, on the mothers, creating an environment that was that what they felt it was good for the children. So basically, they, once you have, you have a house and you have a little bit of land, you can have, you, you can plant your own food, you can have chicken, you can have hens, you can have pig, whatever you want, and you can, in a way, produce your own food. So you are, you are self-sufficient. And these mothers, being self-sufficient, started to generate a community which, which brought them from absolute poverty to be now what they call in Colombia Estrato Tres, means that you are middle class. They, they be, now they are middle class, the houses are their own, they don't starve. During the pandemic, it was fantastic because nobody asked for food because they all could produce their own food and they share their own food. There are trees planted everywhere and the cities, a housing community where people are with open doors, then everybody can share whatever they need. And, they are, and the fruit trees, avocado, orange, well, whatever we produce here, coconut, um, chirimoya, many different trees, inclusive uh, such a inchi, they are all there for everybody to pick whenever they need it. So that brought us, that brought us into, a, into a community uh, which we have been trying to scale. We have been even trying to, pro to, to, um, uh, to suggest that the FARC or that the different housing projects that the government has 
would be able to, to be like Nachira. But obviously, the main problem is that nobody wants, uh, or, or nobody, you know, the patriarchal society doesn't want a society that is managed by women and that the women are the ones who take the decisions. So I remember when Heide came over, there were some men who came to say to her, why don't you, I mean, you know, why don't you suggest that there will be a council of men? And when we suggested this to the women, they all say, no, no, thank you. It's been very, very difficult for us to get where we are. So we want to continue. And as it is, now Nachira is managed by women. And the children who are grown up have grown up in a matriarchal community or, or, in, a, or in a community, which is the, where decisions are taken by the women and, and, who, and, who, and who have different set of values. It's interesting to see that even though there are some small businesses that have started in Nachira, uh, there's nobody who has started a big business and putting everybody to work for them. I and mean, you know, I mean, they, they are not, we have not, it has not become a capitalist, a capitalist society. It's very, been very much, it's been uh, very much on the gift economy. As it is, uh, the, 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 the book that the children uh, get whenever they start reading, the James book for Paradonar, forgiving, not forgiving, but the children book that James has produced, Por Amor y Por Dinero for love and for money. So that book, that little book with lots of pictures is the book that all the children of Nachira have ever since the moment they start to read. So somehow the values are different. There are different set of values. Now some of them are teenagers. Obviously we have been very lucky in there are no teenage pregnancies, which is one of the main problems that we have in Colombia, teenage pregnancies. One teenage pregnant girl who obviously uh, it became a mother, and she is a, she, she, unlike her mother or the other women, she's studying at the university, she's studying law being held by everybody, and, the, and her child is being raised by all the women together from Nachira. So it's, it is, it changed completely paradigms that, that, uh, that different sort of community has. When I have tried to propose that there should be that free housing is what would be able to change the world because when the free houses are given to women, they have a, a roof over their heads. And that also means that they can decide not only on their house, but on their own bodies, because that means that they don't need a man to come and help her and, and help them with the economy, but it's their own economy. And they will spend the money, whatever they think is most important, generally feed the children, how to feed the children, how to educate the children and how to make the children happy are different from when these societies may come the patriarchy because the patriarchal society tend to spend the money on weapons, on cars, on, on all these things that are not really need for everyday life. So basically that is what has happened to, to, our, to our people in Nachira and now of course we are 20, we have been there for 20 years. We are trying to see where this can be escalated or in other places, but always the problem is we don't want a society which is managed by women. We don't want that. That, that has been the reply of the government, the reply of everybody. We hope that this government in which we have more than half of the people in government are women, even though the president is a man, will be able to accept that model, that model as the model of, of, of generating communities. And these are housing states, open communities, which, which people live with open doors. So we just take away the individualism I and mean, people who are older and looked after by the other people around because, because everybody knows each other. Thank you, Angela. I have put your um, another uh, link, the link to your original salon that you did uh, December 2020 that actually has the video. So you can learn more about um, Nashira there and how to contact Angela. The second speaker, because these are always the practical questions. How do you begin this? How do we change? And that salon has two examples, physical examples of communities that have risen up from the urban environment 
using the maternal gift economy and matriarchal values that uh, Jen, Heidi, Darsha uh, speak about in terms of how we can actually shift this. Mary, going from uh, you know this uh, notion of sacrifice to how we reclaim all of these words, what Migmahan was saying that we need to go back to our mother tongues to return to the original meaning that's rooted in this very, I don't know how else to say it, but radical way back to the root of who we are. And so um, I am doing a time check because we only have 10 minutes. So Harold, I'm very sorry that we only have about 10 minutes before we need to close uh, I would like to continue a everyone to oh, only a few seconds. Okay, yes. Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, when I said all Europe is a showcase, I certainly didn't mean that matriarchal structure and maternal gift economy, economy was only then possible. Certainly, I agree with Heide that mat matriarchal structures were in other cases of initial cultural development. But the showcase of all Europe is that their society developed into a later developed advanced stage, what we by definition call complex society. My recent book is about the Brandenburg uh, gate in Berlin as an icon of peace. Peace in the meaning of peace as state, like in old Europe. And the original idea, who would be the um, leader of the, of the uh, chariots on top of the Brandenburg Gate? The original idea was it was Irina, the Greek um, goddess of peace, who represented in mythology peace as a state without thinking of war. But what was chosen was the Roman goddess of Victoria. The Roman goddess Victoria, she is the goddess of peace because it was the uh, victory over Napoleon. And that is well known, this trail, the patriarchal of the patriarchal system the Roman Victoria. What is not known is the original idea to put uh, the Greek goddess Irene there, who um, is a symbol of peace as state. And Irene is not a Greek goddess, because as a linguist, I found out and researched that Irene actually is a, could you, you could say, it has a, she has a pre-Greek name and her cult is pre-Greek and you could call her a daughter of the great goddess of old Europe. So what I revealed as something completely unknown until now is that the original idea of the Brandenburg Gate with Irina is a, a clear association with the peace idea of old Europe. Thank you so much, Harold. That sounds fabulous. It's so important to reveal the roots of peace and the great mother in all of her names. So I, I am uh, wanting to be respectful of everyone's time. We have seven minutes left until the time that we close. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Jen, do you have any closing words you'd like to say before we leave today? I just thank you everybody for all your thoughts and uh, it's wonderful hearing everyone. And uh, we, we'll, make peace on earth uh, with uh, a maternal basis and, uh, and an economy that's based on giving and there we are. Um, to our speakers, would anyone else like to just say some last goodbyes or thank yous? Haida. Yes, I would like to thank you all for your thoughts. And I would like to add one from my side. When we want to get rid of our way of life, we at first have to get rid of our extreme individualism. We all sit in the box of our individualism. 
And so we are very reluctant to create maternal communities because when we want to survive, we can survive only in communities. And uh, one uh, anthropologist once said, only tribes or tribe-like societies will survive. So we should think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Darsha? I put a link in the chat to our recent book with four arrows, uh, Restoring the Kinship Worldview. It's actually a place to start uh, to actually uh, readopt the indigenous perspective, the, the sustainable perspective on the earth. Uh, and all the profits go to indigenous communities. So it's, uh, it's a gift. Uh, and the audible is especially nice because my co-author uh, plays the flute. Uh, well, and, and I want to add that, yes, the uh, audio book is actually delightful because both authors are speaking. I've listened to it, Darsha. It's fabulous. So please, I want to encourage you. Uh, you can do it while you're, you can listen while you're driving or while you're uh, cleaning your house. Okay, so thank you, Darsha. Uh, Mary, would you like to say anything before we close? Um, I would just like to say thank you to all the contributors and all the questions that have pulled us out of our comfort zone to um, address them. And um, yes, thank you all and have a good evening for what remains of it from Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. How about you, Susan? Closing words. No, it was okay. Yes, well, thank I, you, and 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 peace to to all of us. Good luck to all of us. <laughs> Let's hope you well, know we all invent something that can contribute to to a peaceful world, which is what we need. Beautiful. That is such a perfect segue, Diane. Would you please make sure that you have put in in the chat the registration link for next weekend, which is our salon number 40, the truth in peace and war. So uh, we're very excited to be able to offer that to you um, to, to we're in, as Jen reminds us, as uh, each of the speakers that we're in a place of crisis. So um, we would love to have you join us. Um, I would just interrupt and say that it's not next weekend, it's two weeks. Oh, two weeks. December, yes, so the, 17th. December the 17th. That's that's right. Thank you for, for that reminder. And um, let's see, our speakers will be Medea Benjamin, Karina Kylo, and Paula McCurry. So we are really excited and thank you to the speakers for joining us today. Thank you, Diane, for the tech. And for each of you, your patience, I know it's very challenging in this format to, to go sequentially because there are so many, you know, we're so creative in our thinking that we have many thoughts that get sparked. So we jump around. I wanna encourage you before I say goodbye to do save the chat if you would like to follow along with what others are saying. And again, thank you so much for continuing on this endeavor with us, this experiment to shift to the gift. That's what I like to think. Shift to the gift, everyone, and return to the maternal, the, matri the modern matriarchal values so that we can uh, move into the realm of where we all want to be in a world of peace and plenty and uh, creativity. So we will see you in two weeks. Thank you all very much. Bye for now and we'll see you again. Please take good care of yourselves and enjoy your gifts of the season. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.